Hello, everyone. I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. We have some guests with us, uh, Rachel. Good morning. And Jonathan. Hi. Now, we're here to talk about God. Before we do that, I just want to acknowledge the traditional lands that we're all meeting on and acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. And because this is going to be a talk about film, also I want to uh, acknowledge um, Indigenous people in the film industry and their experiences. Now, we're meeting to talk about God because Rachel is doing a project. Rachel, can you tell us what that project is? Um, so in my project, I'm researching the portrayal of religion in film and television from the silent era to now, and like looking at like how what's going on in society at the time is impacting that. And Jonathan's here because he knows a lot about film. Jonathan, why is God portrayed in films? <laughs> That's a big question to start with. Uh, why is God portrayed in films? Well, uh, films are about storytelling. Um, and uh, there are a number of reasons why religious themes and therefore uh, characters like God are portrayed in film. Um, uh, so some, some people theorise, you, you hear this when you do creative writing courses and so on, that there are only seven plots uh a guy called chris booker i think in the um i'm not sure when wrote, wrote a book called the seven basic plots and he says that every uh filmic story every tv show blah 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 they're all versions of these seven plots or mixtures of these so some people suggest that religious themes and god stuff turns up and god as a character just because of this idea you know, people like Joseph Campbell have uh, uh, previously talked about that. Joseph Campbell is the guy who uh, wrote a famous book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, um, where he talks about the heroic journey as being kind of the standard template for uh, narratives. He says there's only one one uh, plot. And, and so people like George Lucas and so on have taken that seriously. You know, George Lucas, when he's writing the first few Star Wars films, uh, was using the heroic journey as a template. And you can see the um, passages in those movies as fitting that very perfectly. So some people would say, why are religious things in films? Well, it's because there's only a certain number of stories and religious ideas form part of those. Some other people would say that God's portrayed in films uh, uh, because of money because the um, religious audience might be seen to be a large audience and you want to satisfy them with stories that they will pay to go and see. And you can look up particular statistics about particular um, uh, films and so on and the way they're promoted that suggest that might actually be a part of the story. Sometimes religious themes, God stuff, are portrayed in films because the creators themselves have particular faith kinds of struggles. Um, they're grappling with faith issues and and do that over decades. So people like Martin Scorsese are good examples of that kind of thing where he has, since he was first making films in the 60s, uh, always been a person um, uh, who's struggled with what faith is and how faith interacts with daily life and, and so on. So he's drawn to stories that... Uh, deal with that in very obvious, clear ways, um, and we might get to some of those later. Uh, but he's also interested just metaphorically in how those religious themes can be involved in his stories too. So, yes, sometimes because creators are struggling with those faith things themselves. Sometimes uh, the religious stuff is in films because um, filmmakers want to critique religious things Um and a, a relatively recent modern example of that is a movie like Spotlight, you know, which uh, uh, lifts the lid, that's not the right term, but, it, you know, examines the complicity of church and also the state with covering up child sex abuse um, in a city in the United States. So sometimes filmmakers might want to critique those things, so they'll include God portrayals and religious themes in order to do that. Sometimes filmmakers might just want to provoke debate about religious things so they include those things in uh their films so there's a famous clip where um once again george lucas is interviewed uh 
back when I think the prequel trilogy was coming out, or maybe it was just before that. Um, and um, as part of this series of interviews, they looked in, into kind of the faith side of things and the force as a religious idea. And the interviewer asked George Lucas, um, you know, why did you put the force into your films? And he answers that he thinks uh, people should have an opinion or be provoked to make a decision about their opinion about religious things and that he included the force in uh, his films in order to provoke that kind of debate. Now, I'm always not sure whether that's a thing he's kind of decided in retrospect uh, <laughs> once um, those religious themes have been dissected by people. But anyway, that, that's a thing that he said. And, you know, sometimes religious themes and God stuff are included in films just purely out of an uh, evangelistic motive. So there's a kind of a genre of, you know, religious films made by religious people with particular desires to um, uh, encourage people to uh, adopt Christianity themselves. You know, God's Not Dead and that series of films. Films like that might have that debate, that have that motive so there are a whole bunch of reasons why religious stuff can end up in films in the end uh the, the bottom line is it's all over the place there's heaps of this stuff whether it's direct portrayals of religious things or whether it's you know metaphorical um examinations of themes that we might also say are religious themes although uh, someone who's not a religious person might argue, well, those themes aren't just religious themes. They're general themes that are central to human beings. Um, but, yeah, a lot of it out there, that's for sure. And a side question, does yeah. it help or hinder God and religion when it's portrayed in films? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think God's bigger than <laughs> the film industry. So uh, does it help? Or hinder. I, I think there's more going on in society that does this. I'm always nervous about arguments, you know, that say um, that the film industry or the TV industry or media in general is causing people to do things or become mass murderers or whatever. Uh, you know, video games are rotting the minds of our children. I'm sort of suspicious of those kind of arguments because when you decide that just one thing as part of larger society is having this direct causal effect on a particular thing that that never really makes sense when you consider how complicated societies are and all of the different influences influences that are going on in society. Um, uh, you know, so maybe maybe films are just telling these stories because people are interested in them, or some people would say, well, no, the films are causing people to be critical or or whatever. Uh, I don't know as far as that goes. But Actually, did you have ended, a, nah. did you have a perspective on that? Um, well, I guess yeah, like people like it's, it, well, I guess like in terms of like the having an influence on society, like I guess it's interesting looking at it, it that that like yeah, people well that people say like having a negative influence on society, but then like you said that there were the deliberate evangelizing portrayals of religion. So like people you so like not only is like portrayals of different things being like like I guess like seen to have like negative influences on people, but then there are other people like deliberately trying to have like the like positive influence of like from their perspective. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? For for me, um for me, I kind of flip that around on its head because for me, the most interesting depictions of faith and religion and God stuff often come from filmmakers who aren't, uh, wouldn't be seen as part of the church. I, that to me is the most fascinating place where religious stuff is happening because you really are seeing religious ideas bubbling up out of, out of humanity without kind of um, what could be seen as coercive motives. And the, the evangelistic attempts at filmmaking to me, often are the least successful because they they tend to be artistically the least interesting and the most kind of lowest common denominator. Let's not offend anyone, but try to um, be 
cheery and happy and family orientated and so on. Um, you, other people would have a very different opinion to me on that. But but for me, what what grabs my attention the most is when you're watching a Marvel film or something like that, and a rel- religious stuff is being portrayed there. That to me is fascinating. Why that's happening, as we've already talked about. And how is God portrayed in films? Yes, another huge question, David. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> huge question. Uh, because um, you know, ever, ever since films have been made into the kind of end of the nineteenth century and to twenty twenty three now, uh, uh, religious themes and God in particular has been portrayed in different ways. Um, uh, a, a significant factor in this is that in the mid '30s or so, Hollywood, and we're dealing with Western cinema here, acknowledging that Western cinema is not the only cinema, but in Western cinema, uh, in in the mid '30s, um, the major studios signed up to a particular kind of ethical code, which uh, you know the, the Motion Picture Association code, which is known as the Hayes Code, but after the guy who was in charge of that association at the time. Um, the studios had been tinkering around in sort of the decade before that with uh, will we create some kind of code to determine uh, what are good things to portray and what aren't good things. But in the mid-30s, they ratified that. And so from the 30s through to around the mid-60s, there were real restrictions on what you could show in films and what you couldn't. Um, that was everything from, <clears throat> pardon me, criminals being seen to succeed. You weren't allowed to portray that. Criminals always had to get their just desserts. Uh, the way drugs were portrayed, the way sexuality was portrayed, all of these things were um, strictly enforced by studios who didn't want to be seen to be contravening this code. And along with that came uh, the way that religious ideas were portrayed and priests were portrayed and therefore the way God was portrayed. It had to be done in respectful kind of uh, uh, kind of ways. Now, that happened in the mid-30s. Uh, there were portrayals of God prior to um, that. Uh, but having said that, they weren't kind of outrageous or anything. There were other things going on in Hollywood back in those days which meant that that code became, uh, became a real thing. But in the beginning, um, uh, you could say God was portrayed in very conventional ways, um, uh, typified by, uh, say, you know, the Ten Commandments from 1956. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a direct biblical portrayal, and the first portrayals of God through into the 60s were all just really biblical portrayals by and large. And uh, so, you know, in the Ten Commandments, you just get a burning bush and you get a deep, sonorous voice appearing out of the burning bush. Um, uh, Charlton Heston playing Moses, talking to that burning bush. An interesting side fact, um, it's said that Charlton Heston only agreed to take the role of Moses if he could uh, also do the voice of God. <laughs> So when Charlton Heston has that conversation with God at the burning bush in the Ten Commandments, he's actually talking to himself, which interests a kind of inter, uh, um, introduces a kind of a meta level on what's happening and what Hollywood might be saying about what God is and so on. But there are a lot of kind of grey-haired man kind of pictures there. Uh, prior to that, um, over in the UK, we had films like um, Stairway to Heaven, um, uh, in which God is portrayed as a judge with a judge's wig and so on, and he's sitting in heaven passing judgment on David Niven, who wants to go back to earth, blah, 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 long plot story there. Um, there are a lot of portrayals like that, even up to 1975, you know. Pardon me. Monty Python and the Holy Grail has a moment when... Um, the knights of the round table are given their mission by God and God portrays as an animated figure in the clouds um, uh, and is a traditional grey-haired God. He does, and he's wearing a crown and so on, he does have these sort of burning red eyes which add another layer onto 
what the uh, Monty Python guys might be trying to say about Guy. And he's also cranky and so on uh, in keeping with the comedic kind of tone of how that's how that happens. But, you know, through the 30s, the 40s, the 50s and the 60s and into the 70s, you see a lot of God as a grey haired old man. And um, that that's in keeping with the way God has been portrayed uh, forever in in the visual arts, you know, whether it's Michelangelo on the Sistine Chapel or Rubens or William Blake's drawings of God, they're all of a grey-haired old man kind of thing. So the movies sort of keep with that attitude. The, the one interesting thing that stands apart from that, um, a film I find particularly interesting, um, and, you know, c- cut me off here because I could talk a long time about a lot of stuff, <laughs> but in 1936, um, a film was made of a very popular stage play called The Green Pastures. It's not a really well-known film, um, but... It's one of only six films, I think, um, in the studio kind of era of filmmaking that had an only African-American cast. So for 1936, you know, that was a pretty big deal. And it does cop some criticism because of some of the kind of stereotype portrayal of some of those um, black uh, characters and so on. But it is fascinating because The Green Pastures is kind of the story of Uh, Well, it has a framing device about a Sunday school class and um, the Sunday school teacher throughout the film tells his students various biblical stories and sometimes kind of extra biblical stories. They're not from the Bible, but go a bit beyond the Bible. Once again, that's quite fascinating for its time. It's quite ahead of its time. And the... So, so the majority of the film is taken up with these depictions of biblical and extra biblical stories and characters from the Sunday school class, the teacher and people who come into the room and so on, are all the people who then are Moses and God and the Archange- Archangel Gabriel and so on. So it's a little kind of um, Wizard of Oz like that, you know, where um, the story that happens in Oz is populated by characters who then Dorothy, uh, you know, Dorothy's uncle and grandma and so on. Anyway, so we have in this story, The Green Pastures, an African-American depiction of God called um, in the kind of vernacular, accepted vernacular of the time, De Lord. And uh, he's sitting up there in heaven and heaven is portrayed with lots of angels, all African-American angels singing and having picnics and having a great old time. And, yeah, it's quite fascinating because of this, and especially in the way it ends, uh, uh, because it goes through a lot of Old Testament kind of stuff and sort of skips the New Testament. But then, uh, uh, spoiler, in in the end, a God, the God character realises that he needs to be more merciful with humanity that he can't be so judging of them. And he realises that he needs to be merciful because he looks down at Earth, and and this kind of happens off-camera, he looks down at an off-camera Earth and see says, I can see a man down there who's the most, paraphrasing, the most merciful person ever, and I'm learning something from him. And look, they're taking him to die on a cross and so on. So it's interesting that while it it's mostly biblically based, it, it really veers off there and sort of sees Jesus as a man who uh, whose ministry teaches God something about the need to be merciful. Now, you could be really critical of that from a Christian point of view and say, oh, they're mucking around with the Bible. That's terrible. It's terrible. For me, academically, it's much more interesting because you, you ask the question of why they might be doing that, what they're getting at, what does that communicate to audiences, all those things we talked about before. So, yeah, The Green Pastures stands out of that whole um, run of films that have God as a grey-haired old kind of man. But after the 70s, things kind of change pretty radically. We still have um, films like Oh God, you know, with John Denver and George Burns, the old comedian playing God. He doesn't have a beard, but he is an old uh, white guy. And it's played for comedy. Uh, uh, comedic kind of effect. But then as the years go on, we get things like um, 
uh, Almost an Angel, uh, the Paul Hogan kind of vehicle. It's the film he made after Crocodile Dundee was so successful and Almost an Angel is was not nearly as successful. <laughs> but it it it's he, he plays a guy who is a criminal who uh, uh, gets hurt in a car accident and um, seemingly ends up in heaven and God tells him, I want you to go back to earth and to do good things to try and earn your way back to heaven. And, of course, God is played by Charlton Heston, uh, uh, who looks a lot like Moses, so it's very kind of self-referential in that sense. Um, it actually turns out in the end that Paul Hogan's character uh, didn't die and go to heaven. He was only hallucinating all of this, it seems, um, which then becomes an interesting theme. We see in a number of films uh, where people may may not be hallucinating whether God is actually there or not. So the filmmakers like to have a kind of a bet each way about whether God is real or not or is just a product of a knock on the head or mental illness or something like that. Uh, we see that um, a number of times. So that in, for instance, just jumping out of the timeline here, in Ridley Scott's Exodus Gods and Kings in 2014, um, uh, we see, uh, you know, the Moses story told once again. Um, Christian Bale there. Is Christian Bale? Yeah, playing Moses. And um, in the burning bush kind of story, part of the story, uh, Moses is tending sheep up on the hillside and there's actually like a mudslide and he gets, um, when he wakes up, only his face is kind of appearing out of the mud on this hillside and he has then this burning bush experience. But God also appears, as well as the burning bush, as a child and a kind of a petulant child who um, is, is cranky with Moses. And you ask yourself the question, so why, why does Ridley Scott decide to change that story and have this mudslide happening and Moses encased in the earth? Well, there, are, there could be some interesting theological things going on there with the, the kind of um, um, incarnational nature of being from earth and, you know, Adam created from dust and so on. But it also produces the possibility that uh, the Moses character is just hallucinating this whole conversation with God because he has a concussion because of being involved in that kind of mudslide. So, yeah, the, the mental health kind of issue is brought up there a little bit just because filmmakers, I think, are wary of being accused as being too literal about God and they don't want to alienate any part of their audience who might not um, be people who believe in or profess to believe in a God. Um, since then, there have been all kinds of depictions. And, you know, I'm, I'm missing out tens and hundreds of depictions along the way just to sort of pick out some more interesting ones. Um, back in 99, Kevin Smith makes his film Dogma, um, uh, where uh, uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon play two angels trying to get back into heaven who've been thrown out of heaven for misdemeanours. And towards the end of that film, God does turn up, uh, played by Alanis Morissette, and I really love that depiction. It, it's, it only lasts for a few minutes, but uh, obviously God here portrayed uh, by a woman and um, she's she can't speak because if she speaks, she'll blow everyone's minds and so on. But she is depicted sort of playing in a garden and doing cartwheels and falling over and smiling and so on. Um, one of the characters asks Alanis Morissette as God, why are we here? What's the purpose of everything? And God just smiles and leans over to the character and boops her on the nose and, you know, smiles and that's the answer. So I like that depiction. I, I am drawn to the more unconventional kind of depictions of God we see along the way. There was a film called Rapture Palooza. Once again, not a big uh, box office winner. Um but it featured Ken Jeong, the uh, comedic actor who's in Community and lots of other things, Hangover. Um, he plays God in that film. Rapture has happened. And uh, this couple were trying to survive 
um, Hell on Earth. And he turns up towards the end of that film and is a really cranky, sarcastic kind of God uh, who can't believe humanity's doing what it's doing and so on. So lots of depictions like that. Um, these are, tend to all be from the Western side of cinema, but there are mentions of God and depictions of God in other parts of cinema as well. Um, I don't know if you decide that European cinema is also part of Western cinema. It is in some ways and isn't in others. But in 2017, there was a really interesting film called, uh, to use the English title, Brand New Testament, um, in which God is depicted as, uh, once again, a cranky old guy in a dressing gown, sitting in God in front of his computer like an internet troll, um, commenting on posts in Twitter and so on and complaining about things. Um, and he accidentally ends up on Earth. So it's sort of an incarnational idea, but he ends up on Earth as himself, a cranky old guy. He's a God who is desperately jealous of Jesus because Jesus is so popular and such a nice person, but he's seen as such a judgmental old cranky guy. And uh, the story unfolds from there with him in his crankiness and in true comedic sense he he learns no lessons and remains cranky right up to the end of things um one of the other interesting sort of portrayals in recent years then is something like the shack you know based on a book that sold a lot of uh copies within christian circles about a guy who goes to a shack to kind of get over his grief about uh, the death of a child in a, a you know child sex related incident so it's pretty um, heavy going kind of stuff. But interestingly, at this shack he goes to to work through his grief, he meets God. And in fact, God has invited him to the shack. And what makes this portrayal interesting in terms of all of these filmic portrayals of God is that for one of the first times, or at least in the most extended sense, you get a Trinitarian depiction of God. That rarely happens elsewhere where the Trinity is all together on the screen at the same time. Even Brand New Testament only had God and Jesus. But the shack um, has a God who is called Papa and is portrayed by uh, the African-American actor uh, Octavia Spencer. So once again, you have a, a female God um, who is friendly and kind and uh, mischievous and so on. But you also have a Jesus de uh, depicted who's portrayed by, I think, um, a Middle Eastern actor. And you also have a Holy Spirit portrayed as a human character uh, by an actor, a lady who I, I think might be Hawaiian. And um, the Holy Spirit is given a name, Sarayu, which in Hindi means uh, wind or can be just a, a portion of the Ganges River, but it's a sacred portion of the river. So, yeah, you get a Trinitarian picture of God there, and uh, maybe that's heretical because <laughs> how can the three persons be depicted in that way? But, the, you know, there's a famous icon um, created many centuries ago where God's depicted in that way too, so it's difficult to portray the Trinity without being heretical. So there's a long history of portrayals of God um, uh, reverently done in years gone by and the green pastures sort of standing out from that. But gradually, as the Hayes Code especially starts to loosen its grip into the um, 60s and on, you see very different portrayals of God, often comedic uh, portrayals where it's possible to uh, well, well, first, things like Oh God, and they made three of those films, where God uh, pokes fun at other things and is a bit of a comedian, but he himself is not made fun of. And then as the years roll by, you see comedic portrayals which make fun of God, and God is um, a character who can be satirised uh, uh, as well. But also, interspersed with that, there are other serious portrayals like The Shack and so on. So a long history and a lot going on with all of those portrayals. Rachel, when you think about God in films, what stands out to you? Oh, well, I guess 
like yeah like what we're talking about like the like it's like more comedic portrayals and even I oh I oh, I had a question about oh, oh well I had a question about like the portrayal of God in film changing over time I guess you already talked about that and also I guess like are you wondering about like are there any significant instances of public backlash against these portrayals because like you're saying that like under the Hayes Code like there were many depictions that couldn't get made because they would have they would have violated the code but then like the more comedic portrayals like is there like significant like yes yeah, attracting significant criticism like sure sure I mean there, there's even more layers to this uh I talked about the Hayes Code but really it's about postmodernism and the the onset of postmodernism in the early 20th century and on where uh people see that um meta narratives can be criticized uh, uh there, there's other layers too because um and this is this is just a kind of a factual thing there's no kanye west racism here but often the head of studios were jewish people um there were significant jewish figures throughout um the studios and so they just didn't want to see God portrayed at all because as part of their faith, God cannot be portrayed. Um, uh, so interestingly, any time that God is portrayed, it, it's done, say, through the Old Testament where there's a shared idea there with uh, Christianity and Judaism. Um, and, and so that, that was going on there during that Hayes period as well. So it might not just be that portrayals couldn't be made, but that they didn't actually really want to make them anyway but then yes once we get into the 60s and into the 70s and you see some of these other portrayals of god and religious themes you do start to see um backlash against some of them and two of the most obvious examples of that are probably um monty python and the holy grail kind of slipped by because the god thing and that is so brief but say Monty Python's Life of Brian, which doesn't really feature God depicted apart from, you know, Jesus as part of the Trinity and as God. Um, and, and there were a lot, a big backlash and a lot of protests outside cinemas about that film and the way that the Brian character, who seems like a kind of a Jesus analogue, is portrayed as a person who's just purely human and uh, really a victim of... Um, a society who wants to make him into a, a Christ figure, even though he's actually not. I mean, uh, there was a lot of backlash about that. But once again, if you actually look at the film, Jesus is portrayed in that film in the first few minutes. Uh, you know, the Sermon on the Mount uh, portion of the Gospels is portrayed, and Jesus is just a figure way off in the distance. Um, and he's delivering Sermon on the Mount stuff verbatim from the Bible, in effect done in a very respectful way. And it's only the, the, the comedy aspect of that is that people, some people are so far away from Jesus that they can't hear exactly what he's saying and think he's, think that blessed are the peacemakers is blessed are the cheesemakers and so on. And so, you know, I think that film is not really, you, you could argue it's not making fun of a Jesus uh, but it's more making fun of the propensity for human beings to look for heroes beyond themselves when they could be, uh, you know, living their lives without that kind of stuff. So, yeah, there was a lot of backlash for that film. And Dogma, and, I remember there was backlash to Dogma, if I remember correctly. Yeah, da Vinci Code. yeah once again, once again. Um, and Dogma is a controversial film because, you know, it's Kevin Smith film and... There's F-bombs going off left, right, and centre all the time. Uh, but you could also say that his actual depictions of the actual figures, you know, the God figure is actually treated very reverentially, the Alanis Morissette God. Uh, she might be playing in the garden, but I, to me that's a really positive way to depict God, you know, a playful creating God. And she heals people in the movie and so on. That's portrayed very reverentially. But, yeah, Dogma was another one of these. And Last Temptation of Christ, you know, the Martin Scorsese film um, uh, from 88, also really copped it. 
and people who criticised that film uh, criticised it because there's a sequence in the film where Jesus uh, uh, comes down off the cross, doesn't die off the cross, and goes on to um, marry Mary and have a family life and so on. And so people considered that to be very anti the Christian faith and really um, uh, kind of dismantling the Christian faith. But once again, if you actually watch the film <laughs> and not just um, criticise it based on a story you heard about a you know five-minute portion in it, you discover that that section of the film is actually is the last temptation of Christ. And it's actually a, 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 a place where Jesus is tempted by a kind of a devil Satan figure to come down off the cross. And this is what your life will be like if you don't sacrifice yourself and, you know, die for sins and all that kind of stuff. So uh, uh, in the end, Jesus does not succumb to that temptation and chooses to stay on the cross, refuses that temptation. So, <laughs> you know, to me, that that's a profoundly in keeping with the Christian message that uh, what Jesus is doing there on the cross is profoundly important. And even if he's tempted by a life that could be lived in, an, in an, another way, he sticks to um, the mission, if you want to use that word, of what's going on there through his um, sacrifice on the cross. And when it comes to a portrayal, I was watching Indiana Jones yesterday and there's a scene there where you want. Yeah, the new one. And they have, there's a scene there where they have uh, an artifact and they say, oh, this will give you a lot of power, you know, more than an emperor, a god. And, and it made me think about how, yeah, often when God is referenced in films, they focus on the, or the power. They don't focus on the, well, this will make me as loving as God or as caring as God. They always associate him with the all powerful. So to me, that kind of stood out that they always compare, yeah. focus on the power part. Yeah, it's true, David. You see, when God is portrayed, sometimes God is portrayed because, and I'll, because God is just a mechanism for the plot. I didn't touch on this previously, but really, it's just because you want your main character to have some particular um, narrative experience or ability to do something, and so the God character turns up so that your human character therefore gets that. So you see God who is all powerful in dispensing these abilities or who is like a kind of a Santa Claus kind of figure who you can pray to and um, that God will then give you what you want or not. And that, that's why I say the God portrayal, you know, Morgan Freeman in Bruce Almighty and the, the second film after that, Evan Almighty with Morgan, Morgan Freeman, I just said that, is so interesting because even though it sort of keeps to that idea in that the God uh, portrayal is there as a narrative mechanism to give Jim Carrey's character, you know, the godlike abilities so Jim Carrey's character can see what it's like to be God. Uh, because it's Morgan Freeman and because of what they do with the story, it sort of goes a bit further than that and helps the audience, I think, to understand uh, w what it might be like to be God and how difficult it is to be God and 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 brings up theological issues like why don't all prayers just get answered in the affirmative? Why might uh, why might a God you pray to say no to a particular thing? Uh, because maybe uh, the thing you're praying for isn't the best thing for other people around you and so on. Yeah. Now, Rachel uh, made a good point to me a while ago. Rachel, can you sort of share with us the idea about, given that in society a lot of people aren't religious yet, they're drawn to certain types of films and shows <clears throat> yeah so i guess i was looking at like why are people like i guess interested in this type of show even if they're not like this type of film even if they're not religious themselves like on like is it a case of like maybe it's just like the it's like, like i don't want to say like religious aesthetics or like you're talking about like certain like themes being interpreted as like general themes yeah um i think that th this idea of there being religious themes and that maybe these are just themes that are general to humanity. Um, 
that, that's a big idea that theologians have talked about for a long time. You know, Paul Tillich, the theologian, talked about that back in the middle of the last century um, in the 60s and 70s and on, talking about what he called human concerns. And uh, his, his idea was that these big themes were uh, automatically religious themes, but they were also just um, automatically expressions of what makes us human. And the, the thesis being, therefore, that this kind of religiosity is hardwired into human beings, even if we don't recognise that because our experience of religious things has diminished so far because of the de decline of church and, and our um, suspicion about church and, and organised religion and so on. So people like him talked about the not just overlap, but the, these sort of ideas of uh, big life questions, for instance, are automatically religious things. Um, and it's m my experience of working with people, and especially with young people, uh, over a long time, I'm an old guy, <laughs> but, you know, spending about 35 years of working with young people in high schools and so on, is that if you can talk about these things with the right language and having developed the right kind of rapport with people, everyone just about can engage with these ideas and actually wants to engage with these ideas. Even people who have identified themselves to me as hardcore, you know, atheist people, if you can get a conversation going, not about do you believe that there's a God, but is there something in you that hopes there could be some kind of higher power? Uh, everyone wants to talk about that and has an opinion about that. And uh, I think that films that bring up these things, that enable us to have these kind of conversations more easily, um, you know, some Christian people might be critical of them because they, they aren't strictly following Christian doctrine uh, enough. But for me, they're, they're so useful just because it, it seems to me that People are crying out. Is that the right term? Well, no, people are open to having these kind of conversations and often seem almost hungry to have these conversations if you can do it with the right language that's not off-putting, that's not um, a stereotypical Christian Bible bashing sort of stories, uh, uh, language, or if you, you know, clearly don't, have an obvious motive that you're just trying to get a notch on your Bible and make a person, you know, trick a person into thinking Christian things. But if you're really just open to having these conversations, I think a lot of people want to have them. And it's partly why it's natural for these things, as I was saying before, to appear in films because who makes films? Human beings. And human beings have these questions and want to address them in some ways. Having said that, Sometimes people are interested in these things in films just because of the comedic thing and they want to see a god who's, you know, portrayed as a bit of an idiot or or whatever because that might back up their suspicion or, you know, um, anti-feelings about church things because of some bad things that churches have done over the years, whether it's child sex abuse or colonialism or other things that it's been involved in. On the subject of comedy, can you tell us a little bit about Jesus in comedic? films yes well there's a similar kind of pattern that we talked about in the god uh uh sphere with jesus kind of portrayals and um there are a lot of comedic depictions of jesus i, I won't go into such detail with the jesus ones because i'm not sure how long this interview is supposed to go for um but everything J jesus has been portrayed uh in the comedic sense uh for a long time and especially in the last three or four uh kind of decades especially in, in um, animated things like um south park and uh the simpsons um uh, the, the simpsons by the way has depicted god as well and uh, following the kind of jewish idea that god not be portrayed uh you know god is portrayed but only from the kind of neck down so you don't see God's face. 
Uh, but interestingly, God is a, is the only character, I think, in The Simpsons who's ever portrayed with five fingers. So that's interesting. God is more human than The Simpsons characters because uh, he, in The Simpsons portrayal, has five fingers. Um, but, yeah, there's he heaps of comedic portrayals and mostly mostly kind of satirising the Jesus character uh, uh, as either a kind of a hapless, bumbling fool who's just the victim of forces around him. Uh, the South Park Jesus fits into that um, a lot. Um, yeah, these kind of things going on all over the place. Now, you teach theology and arts. Can you tell us what that course looks like? <laughs> yes um we the the college that i'm part of has a subject called theology of the arts and film uh then just became theology of the arts because i was using film stuff all the way through it and i lecture that subject um so basically this is a subject that's uh coming from a christian point of view because i work for a christian theological college and it's trying to help people understand the ways in which artists and the arts uh, have uh, worked with theological ideas over the years since forever um, and really to help people to give people the ability to kind of theologically reflect on tv shows and films and a painting they might be looking at or an opera they might be seeing or a taylor swift song they might be hearing or whatever it might be that they can theologically reflect on it to um, grapple with the themes that are there or the betrayal that's there and what we can learn from that and so on. Um, th th that's also what was really my aim with young people that I worked with for all those decades. I wanted to give people who weren't necessarily part of the Christian church because this was often in the um, arena of state school religious instruction. I wanted to give people the ability to see a depiction of God or Jesus or religious theme in a film or TV show and work out what's going on there at a deeper level, um, uh, whether it's comedic or otherwise. So the subject is all about that. And we do deal with film things a lot because film is interesting in the arts in that it it's sometimes said to kind of combine various aspects of the arts all into one art form whether that's visual stuff or music or um, audio issues and so on. But we also deal with sculpture things and architecture and photography and visual art, uh, music, um, video clips, um, music video clips, I mean, and a whole bunch of other things. It's a fascinating subject and I really enjoy teaching that one. And when it comes to using the arts for mission, and you've touched on this before about how it can sometimes be a negative thing because it's called, a, you know, giving a really base level view of religion, things like that. What's your view with using the arts to promote religion? Is it kind of not the place to do it or you have to do it correctly? Yeah, well, I think that um, if you're trying to commend faith to someone, um, whether that's in religious instruction or whether that's conversation um, over a cup of coffee somewhere or whatever, then you want to engage with a person's humanity to do that. And so um, because, because modern media are part of people's lives to such a great extent, then it's only natural that you would want to think about uh, and maybe utilise the stories, the narratives that are part of the arts in order to kind of do that stuff. Um, my big thing is just to do it with integrity. You know, I, d I don't like the the kind of so-called evangelism that tries to trick people into believing things or uh, trick them into considering a religious thing without being upfront about doing that. But, yeah, you know, film is part of people's lives. Uh, people are going to films. People are watching films. People are watching stories and TV, listening to music. They're doing that. It's such a big part of people's lives. It's got to be part of... Um, uh, missional kind of stuff as well just because of that uh, so you know you can talk about the story of the prodigal son and that's great but we just have to own up to the fact that sometimes in the 21st century 
even though people's religious literacy is low, a lot of people have just kind of heard or aware of that story to such an extent that it needs, uh, and I'm going to talk about this carefully so it does sound respectful, but it, it's almost like we need to also examine that the same ideas that are going on in that story from other narratives as well, just to kind of revive that and bring new life to it because some of us, some people have just become a bit bored with those stories and they think they know everything about all of the angles from them. But using stuff from film and TV can help us revive that. Look at it afresh. Why do you like film yeah. so much? Oh, well, yeah, you can see I'm enthusiastic about this stuff. <laughs> um, I'm I'm uh, like a lot of people, I think, in that I'm, I'm just drawn to stories. I love stories. Um, you know, I'm a religious person. I'm a Christian person myself. So in church... Uh, when I uh, go on Sunday, if the uh, person who's preaching, uh, you know, they might use a Bible story and talk about I abstract ideas from the Bible, but it's actually, yes, the Bible story and it's any other stories they tell that I always remember after the event. Uh, and I think a lot of people are like that. Stories are so much more powerful than just discussing ideas in the abstract. I like discussing ideas in the abstract too but I remember stories much more easily so you know I'm I'm like a lot of people I grew up ever since I can remember going to the films going to the movies has been part of who I am as a person um I used to go every Saturday you know up until the age of 15 I started working on Saturday mornings it was part of what I did to go to the Valley Twin on a Saturday morning and uh, see films. And I'm still doing that these days. You know, I, I was doing uh, doctoral research and got into the habit of waking up at five o'clock every morning so I could watch a film as part of my research. And uh, that's a habit that I continue uh, even now after that period of my life is done. <laughs> I'm still waking up and watching a film every day just because I love stories. I'm fascinated by stories and especially fascinated by detecting where uh, these kind of religious things pop up along the way. And Rachel, what, what's your interest in sort of media and, and, and films and shows? Where does that come from? I guess, yeah, I very much enjoy the storytelling as well. And I guess what really interests, is, interests me is like the effects that it has on, like on people who consume the stories, like what it makes them feel and think and like, if it, yeah. Excellent. Now, Jonathan, before we say goodbye, are there some films you'd like to plug that you haven't mentioned yet that you want people to watch, films that you really like with a, a religious theme? Uh, I should have thought about this more. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I am, I've already talked about The Green Pastures at length, but I, I really am enamoured of that film just because to me, it's such a curio. Uh, being made back in 1936, it actually deals with some theological ideas uh, in a much more nuanced way than films did thereafter for decades. So, you know, if you've never seen that, it's not a perfect film and it, yeah, it does have some uh, stereotypical portrayals that we look at from the tw with 21st century eyes and uh, they might raise our eyebrows a little bit. But but to me, there's more going on that's of interest in that that really grabs me. Um, I, I, at the risk of sounding like a film snob, I really love a trilogy of films that Ingmar Bergman made in um, the uh, early 60s. Um, and off the top of my head, um, Through a Glass Darkly is one of those where one of the characters, well, well, they deal with profoundly religious kind of themes. Um, the second film in that trilogy uh, is about a priest who's going through kind of doubt experiences in their life. I call him a priest. He's actually probably a pastor. He's probably Lutheran. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a fascinating film uh, in that, once again, it deals with faith issues at a much deeper level than the kind of surface, superficial, doctrinal way that sometimes some other films do. 
I love the silence too. The Martin Scorsese film in 2016, was it? Um, based on the Japanese novel about Japanese priests. Um, I'll get all the dates wrong here. Was it in the 16th century? <laughs> Travelling to Japan to do missional work and s searching for one priest who's kind of gone missing, played by Liam Neeson. And, yeah, that's a Scorsese film that, again, deals with kind of doubt and uh, what it is to, <coughs> pardon me, to try and hold on to your faith uh, through persecution. And it, it's a really fascinating film because Scorsese changes the very end of that film from the novel. I'm not going to say what he does. It's worth looking at and it's worth reading the novel. It's a beautiful novel. Um, so you see a lot of these films that I'm interested in are films that deal with doubt issues. Uh, and some Christians might think, oh, why would I want to watch films that are about doubt? Uh, if you're interested in faith, to me, the what some people would call doubt the flip side of faith. To me, doubt is more a part of faith, you know, that, that people naturally tussle with day by day. And uh, I, I find it fascinating seeing films that do deal with that um, uh, and try to do it in a, in a kind of a grown-up, mature kind of way rather than just saying, oh, doubt's terrible and you should just stop doing it. Um, what's it actually like as a human being to believe? And uh, when doubt is part of that, how do you deal with that? And how can you hold on to the things that you believe are important to me? They're important things to, to think about. Rachel, do you have any... Yeah, so, so they're the handful for today, but if you ask me tomorrow, <laughs> I'd have a totally different set. Do you have any films or shows you'd want to recommend or any final questions for Jonathan? Um, well, what one... Oh, well, actually, first I'll ask a question. I was just wondering about the green pastures. Like, have, have you read anything of, like, what the, like, filmmaker's, like, motive was for making the film? Like it was like it wasn't an evangelizing film. Oh. Well, um, yeah, it's interesting because um, the Green Pastures, as I said, was based on a stage play, and it was an incredibly successful stage play. Uh, so partly the motive was just, wow, that stage play made a lot of money. Maybe we can also make a lot of money. <laughs> so um, the, the the there were more motives than that, but it wasn't necessarily just kind of highfalutin. Um, I'm going to make a film about deep uh, human ideas here. Um, but uh, both the idea of helping a, a Black American cast have a voice in the cinema, uh, in, in cinema at the time, was considered to be one of the things that it was a good thing that film did, which once again was kind of ahead of its time for a film uh, from then. But there, there are also, if you read some of the interviews, and there's actually not a lot of information about this film out there, unfortunately, but uh, people did just want to tell Bible stories on the screen um, because that was a thing that was popular to do and they wanted to do it in a kind of a way that would grab people's attention. And your recommendations, Rachel? Um, well, one that I thought of with the mention of the Japanese novel, this Japanese show I saw... Yu-Gi-Oh! Zaxel. So it's a show about card games, but there's all these like deep Christian allegories in it. If you like really look at the show, like, and there is a depiction of God in the show in a few episodes. And the show has very strong themes to do with redemption. And so the main character like plays a card game with God at one point. And yeah, it, but you think like this, like th this is not a very popular show, even when it aired back 10 years ago, but I think that there is a lot of interesting stuff in there about how they use allegories and like they say in like they like it has lots of sci-fi in it where like they're saying like aliens but what they're clearly depicting is like angels and demons yeah thank you thank you so much to both of you for joining really appreciate it